Hello, everyone. I'm Mayor Satya Rhodes Conway from Madison, Wisconsin, and it is a pleasure to be with you today. Um, I want to introduce myself a little bit, talk about my wonderful city of Madison, Wisconsin, and then I'm here to tell the story of our Madison Cares program. So, um, as I said, my name is Satya Rhodes Conway. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I've been mayor of Madison for four years now. I just got reelected to my second term. Um, I grew up on the East Coast, studied on the West Coast. My background is in uh, ecology and botany. Uh, so not your typical politician, but very much trained as a scientist. Um, I've lived in Madison for over 20 years and um, got into local politics first by serving on the Madison City Council for six years, took a break, and then came back uh, and was elected mayor. Um, I tell you all that because uh, some of it is relevant to the story um, that I have to tell, but also because uh, I want you to know a little bit about me as we go into this. I also want you to know a little bit about Madison. Um, so Madison is a wonderful city of about... 270,000 population. We're the state capital here in Wisconsin. And we have the flagship University of Wisconsin campus in UW-Madison here. And we have a very strong healthcare and health tech sectors in terms of our economy. It's one of the um, driving forces. It's, we're a uh, in some ways, a very typical eds and meds community. We have a lot of strong anchor institutions, um, but we also have a really strong food sector and we're very strong in farm to table um, and uh, in oddly game design and gaming, um, among other things. And the the health sector is particularly relevant to uh, what we'll be talking about today. And so, you know, we have three big um, hospitals and um, a lot of healthcare partners um, in the city. We're a very progressive community politically, a very caring community. Um, and I think that really has set the stage for the Madison Cares program in a number of ways. We also um, are interesting geographically. We're, we're Downtown Madison is on the center of an isthmus between two lakes. And um, our city is in some ways sort of shaped like a barbell with the, the downtown squeezed on the isthmus and then it spreads out on either side um, along the lake shores. And that's important because it, it does sort of constrain the geography of transportation and uh, the delivery of service um, across that geography. Also relevant, um, you know, we are surrounded by other communities uh, most of our borders are set and known, and we have a handful of smaller cities that border us um, that we work very closely with, um, certainly on uh, public safety services, uh, but also on other things as well. And that's another thing that that will become relevant. Um, but mostly what I'm here to tell you about is the Madison CARES program. CARES stands for Community Alternative Response Emergency Services. And I'm gonna talk about what, where this idea came from for Madison CARES, what prompted us to move from talking about it, uh, the idea stage into actually doing it and implementation. Uh, I'm gonna talk about how we got started, some of the partnerships, um, some of the, where this sits in the ecosystem um, of care here in Madison, and then what's next. Um, and as I get started, I want to acknowledge that CARES is certainly not the first um, of its this type of program. Um, we relied heavily on knowledge and learning from the Eugene Cahoots program and Denver Star and um, so, you know, while we're very excited about CARES and, and the work that it's been doing here in Madison, um, there are other places where programs like this have been happening for much longer. Um, and there's plenty to learn uh, from them as well. And we have learned a lot from them. Um, so I want to start with the sort of motivation for me personally. I think that the team that came together around CARES um, 
you know, came from different motivations and, um, you know, brought the idea uh, from different directions. But for me personally, um, we had an incident in my first term um, where we had a, a BIPOC teen um, who was experiencing a mental health crisis, um, sort of got flagged at school. The young person was sent home um, the family uh, couldn't deal with it called the police um and the police response was i think disproportionate to the situation and um in my opinion uh, just very unsatisfactory and it did not lead to a positive outcome for the teen um and then ultimately didn't lead for a positive outcome for either the city or the force either and um i don't think that the, I mean, it wasn't a tragic situation. Everybody's alive. Um, but, and I don't think it's atypical, right? I don't think it's atypical for Madison. I don't think it's atypical for the rest of the country either. Um, so the thing that was special about this particular incident was that it was the first time I had seen it as mayor, um, that something played out in this way. And, um, really just felt like we have to do something better. We have to improve the way that we're responding to people in mental health crisis. And it was led to a community meeting um, in which the community um, basically said the same thing. You have to have a better way to, to deal with these types of issues. And um, and so we started talking about what that might look like. And it turned out that uh, one of our council members, uh, who's now no longer on the council, but, but former council member Arvina Martin, um, had been thinking about this for a while and had had conversations with our then fire chief. He's now retired, um, but Chief Steve Davis, um, they had been talking around the issue and and what, uh, you know, could we copy the CAHOOTS model? You know, it, what would that look like in Madison? And um, so between them and my chief of staff, Mary Batari, um, and, you know, in the wake of that incident, we sat down and said, well, now now's the time. Now let's figure this out. Let's figure out um, what we're going to do here and how we're going to approach these incidents differently. Um, we relied heavily on our data team, uh, which is led by Ellie Anderson, uh, to look at calls for service and do some analysis. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, and we relied heavily on our public health folks. And so here in Madison, we have a joint city county public health department. Um, so we work very closely, uh, obviously, with the public health department. And they have been um, an important part, along with the fire department, in getting this service up and running and uh, making sure that we're staying evidence-based and, and data informed. So coming into this whole um, conversation, my goals were to divert nonviolent mental and behavioral health calls from a police response to an alternative response. And I wanted that to be patient-centered. Um, what we ended up with as the official goals, and if you go to the CARES website, this is what you'll see, um, was to reduce patient, patient contact with police and emergency rooms, to provide patients with help specific to their needs, and to connect patients with additional supportive services in the community. So how do we start? We started um, with data. Um, we had lots of questions, uh, questions like who should go on calls? When did we need to offer a service? Where should that service go? How would be, they be dispatched? I mean, even down to like, what should the team members wear? Um, is it a uniform? Is it law enforcement? Is it fire? Is it, you know, what do they look like? We wanted people to present with a sense of, authority, but also be approachable and um, and be able to engender trust. Um, what kind of vehicle should they drive? Um, how do you um, make, again, that sort of um, trusting uh, relationship uh, and not be intimidating, be welcoming, be de-escalating, but also they got to get places fast. So that was a whole conversation. How do we organize uh, the crews or the staffing, the the scheduling? Um, you know, there's the obvious immediate response, but then is there follow-up and what does that look like? Um, 
you know, how do we track data about people and um, show that the service is working? Um, so there's all sorts of questions that we came in with. Um, and we knew from the beginning that we weren't going to be able to do this alone as a city and that we were going to need to have partnerships. Um, so we talked, uh, we brought together focus groups of mental health professionals, people who have lived experience, uh, practitioners, um, and, uh, you know, really tried to learn from folks and, and talk to people about what this might look like. And as I mentioned earlier, we talked to folks in Denver and Eugene um, about their experiences and tried to learn from national expertise and experience on this. Um, I want to get back to the data for a minute because th this was really important to me. Uh, one of the first things that we did was ask our data team to look at our 911 calls for service and to analyze call types and call volumes. Um, and we worked very closely with our police department um, to look at what kinds of calls we might send an alternative response to. Um, and then once we had figured that out, we did heat maps of those calls and um, to see both geographically where were those calls clustered and then um, to see day of week and time of day so that we could figure out where the highest needs were. And um, I, uh, I was surprised um, at the results of that data. I thought we would probably have the highest need at night, um, even into like late overnight hours. Um, I did think uh, the geography would be centered around downtown Madison, um, but you know, didn't really know what the data were going to show. Well, it it, it did show uh, when we did our first analysis that yes, we had the highest need in the central uh, downtown Madison, but interestingly, the the time. Uh, so day of week was weekdays and the time was the middle of the day. And um, we were not seeing evenings being a peak at all. It was definitely right in the middle of the day. And people were very surprised by this. I was surprised by this. Um, folks, um, you know, sort of anecdotally um, were thinking about, oh, well, I saw somebody, you know, a homeless person in crisis, you know, at midnight downtown and that must be the biggest need. Well, no, turns out, that's actually not the biggest need um, it is mostly things that are happening behind closed doors and, um, you know, in people's homes and and during the middle of the day. So so that is when we started the service. Um, but I get ahead of myself. So um, let me talk now about some of the first steps that we took to actually stand up the CARES teams. Um, we started with an official partnership um, with our uh, local mental health lead, which is Journey Mental Health, and with Dane County, um, who is really responsible for most of the mental health ecosystem in our community. They also have the dispatch center, so they run 911. Um, so we needed that partnership uh, in order to move forward. And um, so that those are, are critical partners in the process, and they have been fantastic throughout. Um, working with the dispatch center, we defined, again, the call types and the dispatch protocols. Um, so the, the kinds of calls that come into 911 and you would dispatch CARES to include suicidal thoughts. And uh, let me pause here to say if anybody, if you or anybody you know or love is um, experiencing suicidal ideation or thoughts, uh, please call 988, um, which is the national mental health uh, call line. Um, uh, depression, anxiety, confusion, agitation, intoxication. These are the kinds of calls that CARES might be dispatched to. And that's where we started. We did it then expand to check person calls as well, but that's where we started. Uh, we settled on teams of two people, a community paramedic and a mental health worker. And here we were able to draw on our existing community paramedic program. Um, that uh, fire department had stood up to deal with people who were frequent users of an ambulance service and try and get ahead of them calling for an ambulance by working with them to find them a healthcare home and to address some of their uh, chronic healthcare issues. So we already had a community paramedic program going. So we were able to, to bring that in and, and connect them with mental health workers from Journey Mental Health. So the mental health workers are employed by Journey. And, and put them together in a vehicle. It's a rebranded fire chief's car, <laughs> a little 
sort of SUV thing. Um, and we found them space, office space in a fire station. And um, so that's where we started. We started with a team that launched in September of 2021. Um, from 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. Monday through Friday with a focus on, our again, our central district, our downtown. Um, and this is based on uh, the police and fire districts. And so that was where we saw, it's, it's our most populous district, but it's also where we saw the highest need. Um, the teams are trained and equipped to respond to nonviolent behavioral health emergency calls um, that don't require law enforcement. Um, their curriculum includes 40 hours of crisis intervention training through the through NAMI. Um, they get cultural competency training. They get de-escalation training, suicide prevention and risk assessment, trauma-informed care training, and more. Um, so this exceeds the training that a paramedic would normally get. Um, but because they are regularly dispatched to these calls, we think it's important for them to be really well-trained. Um, the, the mental health workers are um, also trained on the dispatch radio protocols, the 911 response, and other things um, in terms of the fire department's policy and operating procedures since they're working so closely with firefighters. Um, so everybody's got to be able to speak the same language, right? So that's where we started, September 2021, um, and it was clear almost immediately that this was going to be successful and that we were going to need to grow. So as soon as December of that year, um, we uh, pushed our team to go citywide. Um, they were still, you know, working out protocols and, um, you know, figuring out the office. And uh, But based on the call volumes and the experience that we were seeing on the street, um, it, we felt like we could handle uh, expansion citywide and that, that really made a lot of sense. Um, so that was our first expansion. Um, and we started what we started to see is that the population, and you can see uh, all this data in our annual report, um, the population looks pretty similar to Madison overall, um, except that the folks that the CARES van is uh, interacting with are more likely to report underlying challenges like housing insecurity and substance abuse. And many have some um, pre-existing connection to a service, usually to Journey Mental Health itself, but sometimes to other uh, community services. Um, so we really are serving our entire community and that's, I think, important. Um, I will say that this has been very popular uh, with the Common Council and um, they were excited to approve it initially and have, um, you know, every year since every budget cycle since have been eager to provide more resources. Um, so, uh, and that's actually been a, a topic of some conversation. Some council members have wanted to divert resources from the police department to CARES. Um, the CARES team uh, and my office have been uh, wanting to be very deliberate about our growth and and making sure that that's sustainable and that and we're growing in the right directions. Um, but I, it's I think it's been great that there's been so much support uh, politically from the city council. Um, so just uh, to walk you through some of the expansions. So we had the first expansion to go citywide, and then in April of 2022, we added a second team and started dispatching from another location. So now we have two teams, two locations. Um, in July of 2022, we expanded the hours so that we were doing 12 hours a day, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Um, still Monday through Friday, uh, but uh, and, and then still citywide. So um, very much trying to grow incrementally and to follow the data um, and you know really understand the calls that we were seeing and um, you know, think about uh, that expansion in a in a very you know mindful way. Um, it, one thing I want to mention is that in in addition to responding to the nine one one calls, the CARES teams uh, spend a lot of time trying to build relationships throughout the community. They go to resource centers, to shelters, to healthcare facilities, to mental health facilities. Um, and then between the active calls for service, they also are following up with people that they have seen. So they're following up with patients to assure that that initial connection that they made to a service um, is 
it has lasted, that they that these folks are accessing care in the long term, not just in the short term. The other thing I should mention is that the average call time, so the, the average time that a, a CARES team is out spending with a single patient is about an hour. So they are really spending time with folks. Um, and that is something that when it was a police cruiser uh, or an officer answering these calls, they just couldn't do. They could not spend that amount of time with folks. And so that's another really important piece, I think, uh, of this service. Um, which leads me a little bit to talking about the ecosystem. So um, CARES is just one piece of a larger ecosystem. It is not solving our mental health and behavioral health problems in Madison. It is a significant contribution, um, but it, it really is important that we build out the entire ecosystem. Um, so it, it's it's important important and we know that it's working. Um, one statistic that uh, I, I think is really useful is that only 3% of CARES patients have required police transport. So um, only 3% of the time when the CARES team goes out, are they then calling back to ask for the police to come? Um, and so our goal of diverting from a police response, I think, is we have achieved that. Um, uh, and, you know, that's important because we know that when CARES is responding instead of the police, um, it helps to keep people out of the hospital. It helps to keep people out of jail. It focuses on a patient-centered approach and connects patients to care that's responsive to the specific needs, uh, that their specific needs and also their specific needs in that moment. Um, so that's great, but it also means that we have to have those services to connect people to uh, in that moment that they need. And um, Madison, like I think probably every community uh, is underserved in, in terms of the number of mental health beds that are available. Um, that's a challenge. Um, you know, people have a whole range of needs. And I, I feel like at this point, we haven't really built out the full ecosystem of you know, where people are going then to get long-term care. Um, but, uh, you know, CARES is, is an important piece of that. And um, we're trying to build out that ecosystem. I should say, we still have mental health officers. So we still have police officers that are trained in mental he health issues. And that's an important piece of the ecosystem. Uh, another important piece is that we have started uh, a pilot program. This may be specific to Wisconsin. In Wisconsin, um, historically, you, the to transport folks to a mental health hospital um, and our, our closest inpatient behavioral health service is about 100 miles away from Madison. Um, that has had to be uh, a, a public safety response. It has to be a law enforcement. Uh, so they have to go in a squad, basically, um, which, as you can imagine, is not a great experience for anybody and takes a, a squad off the streets for a significant amount of time. Um, so we we've started a pilot program um, to provide a non-police transport uh, to that facility um, with a private license service. And um, we, again, it's very early days, uh, don't have data yet, but I'm hopeful that that will be a positive um, development. Um, we are obviously always looking to uh, expand what's possible with Medicaid reimbursement. Um, we are always looking to support additional facilities here in Madison where people can get care, um, as well as the investments in root cause solutions like affordable housing and food security, access to jobs, et cetera. So it just, I just wanna acknowledge that, that you know there's a bigger picture around this. Um, Madison Care is, is one part of a continuum of care it's an important part, but it's not the only part. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the successes that we've seen, um, and then uh, we'll wrap up by talking about what I see uh, coming next. Um, I, I, I'm really proud of what Karis has been able to do. Um, in, a, in a little bit, you'll hear from our Assistant Fire Chief, Chase Stedman, um, who has been absolutely brilliant in leading uh, the work around Karis uh, out of the fire department. Um, and so he'll share some of the, the nitty gritty and some of the statistics, but uh, we've heard very good 
feedback from people who either have worked with CARES or whose family members have received care from CARES. And um, they talk about how um, the CARES team develops a rapport, de-escalated tense situations, um, re- was able to reduce trauma for the patient and the family, um, and uh, they're hopeful that it will reduce the frequency uh, of incidents and and trips to have to seek medical care. Um, it cares teams again work with families over not just days but weeks um, to make sure that the patient and the family are are getting connected to the services that they need. Um, we also hear from those services from the service providers about. Um, how the CARES teams, they they call the CARES teams in to have difficult conversations with their clients and to provide those service providers with support to help to build trust uh, with clients. Um, so it, with the result being that, that when some of the clients are not doing well, they actually ask staff to call the CARES team um, to help resolve the situation, which I think is a real testament to the effectiveness of that team. Um, and, uh, you know, we're hearing from the behavioral health community as well, um, how important this uh, service is and the, the fact that they are trained well and particularly trained in, in trauma-informed response has been, I think, really positive. So uh, so really good feedback all the way around. And we're very excited about the, what we consider to be a real success. Um, so what's next? Uh, what's next is we know that we're only responding to just under about 60% of the mental health related calls that CARES could go to. Um, and that's based on uh, data from dispatch. Uh, and we're only going to about 9% of the check person calls that CARES could go to. Um, so we are looking at further expansion. And uh, in 2023, we have budgeted two rounds of expansion. We're bringing on soon another team to serve in the peak hours so that um, particularly that 40% of the calls that we're not catching, a lot of that is because the um, teams are dispatched already and dealing with calls and then another call comes in. So we want to hit those peak hours. um, And then uh, later in the year, we're going to expand to weekends. um, And we are in conversations with the 911 center about dispatch and their staffing needs um, in conversations with our county about how to um, provide more support in the dispatch center. Um, And then we're in conversations with uh, the UW-Madison, so campus, um, and also surrounding communities about ways to expand the service geographically um, to surrounding communities. We do serve campus, um, but they have their own dispatch. And so sometimes they will call CARES, but um, we could serve them um, potentially more. And so all of these are conversations um, as we come into figuring out the 2024 budget um, that we are having right now to to think about what the possibilities are to extend partnerships and serve um, an even greater population, both in Madison and outside of Madison. So uh, in conclusion, um, I think CARES has been a really unqualified success and it's serving patients well. Um, It's popular uh, in the community. It's popular with elected officials. It fills a clear need. And I think it's a model that can be replicated in many communities. And and as I said at the outset, we really replicated, uh, you know, to a large extent what CAHOOTS and STAR are doing here in Madison and uh, really feel like that's a thing that can grow out um, even more into more communities around the country. Um, I want to thank all of you for listening. Um, I think want to thank you for being uh, here today and being interested um, in the story of Madison Cares. Um, I'm happy to invite some questions. I understand we're going to take a little break and then come back with questions. Um, and then also just want to say you're going to hear soon from our assistant fire chief, uh, Chase Stedman, who will talk uh, a little bit more about some of the data. Um, but we are always happy to um, to take follow-ups as well. Uh, if you're interested a- after the fact, um, there is some good information on the City of Madison website, cityofmadison.com, um, about CARES, uh, including our first annual report, uh, which has all the data in it. So if folks want to find that and, and take a look at it, um, there's a good good information there as well. So let me thank you again. Uh, and um, I think uh, we will take a little break and 
and then come back for questions. Hi, I'm Jason Renault, and here with Mayor Satya Rhodes Conway. Uh, thank you so much for speaking to us, and thank you so much for your work to develop Madison Cares. Oh, you're quite welcome. We'll have a chance now for questions. I've got a few to start off with, but if folks have questions, just type them in the chat, and we'll uh, try to squeeze them in. Um, first, I think I'd like to ask Mayor uh, Satya to speak a little bit about the position, her, your position as champion here. And champion seems to be the person that brings all these initial stakeholders together and says, go. Talk to us a little bit about that, those first moments when you were with your city council person who brought the idea forward. How did this manifest? Yeah, so I think um, in almost anything, maybe this is true in any level of government, I don't know, but certainly in local government, you absolutely do need somebody who's going to be the champion. Uh, and, you know, that person can sit in a lot of different places, but it's um, particularly, I, I think it's easier if it's an executive leader um, who can say, yes, we're, we're going to do this because it did require funding, right? It requires budget allocation and it requires staff time. It required, I would say, a lot of staff time in the startup phase to you know, ask and answer all of these questions to go and talk with folks all around the country and um, learn best practices. And um, I didn't, one of the things I didn't talk about is um, we actually dedicated some funds for evaluation, which uh, is run through our public health department. Um, so yeah, there's, it. you really need somebody who um, is able to say to all concerned we are doing this mm -hmm. and we need to do it well. And, um, you know, here's your role in that. Um, so when, uh, and I, I should say, uh, you know, uh, while I have been a very public champion uh, of CARES and, and this work, the actual sort of nitty gritty work uh, is has largely done by my chief of staff um, who really leaned into this project and, um you know, when we had that initial meeting with the alder and the fire chief and myself and my chief of staff and sort of all said, oh, yeah, this is the thing. Let's do this. Right. Let's figure out how to do this. Then I was in the position of being able to, you know, go out to the council and say, I want to do this. Let's do this. Right. Let's go. And I was in the position of being able to say to department heads like, wow, this is going to be great. We should really do this. But it was my chief of staff who was scheduling the meetings and making sure that people were following up and like, where's the data analysis and have we answered this question? And so it was really important to have, I think, both of those. And then it was equally important that our fire chief wanted it, right? Like was, right. It was ready to say, Yes, put it in fire, you know, and and that I, you know he would assign an assistant chief to to help manage it in the long term, and um, so I, you know I'm definitely have been a champion, but it it does take a bunch of different roles to to get a program like this up off the ground. And it, it seems like your fire 
was there at the very beginning and said yes? And is that um, uh, if your police chief had been there and said yes, would you have gone in a different direction? So we already had um, a co-responder model. So we already had mental health officers and and a co-response. Um, and it, uh, so it was it was like we were looking for something beyond that. Um, could we have put it in the police department? I guess we could have, but since part of the point was to really provide a different type of response um it, you know we needed obviously we needed the police chief uh to be on board with it and to mm -hmm. be supportive and and they are i should say broadly quite supportive um but I, we never considered housing it in the police department because we really did want to be diverting the calls we wanted to create a different sense of trust with the community that this was not about law enforcement that you weren't going to get arrested um right uh, that it was about care and and you know it was a patient focused and so you know we could have i guess we could have put it in public health um but because fire already had the community paramedic program because the fire chief was enthusiastic it just made a lot of sense to go there you have two other great partners. You have your public health county program, and you have your private nonprofit mental health care program, Journeys. Yeah. Speak a little bit about how you, as a city, partnered with these two agencies. It's not a always fit. Yeah. So um, I think it's been really important. And, um, you know, people who are in, in local government know that sometimes cities and counties don't always get along. Um, and that's been true in Madison in the past, but the the current county executive and I have a really strong collaborative relationship, and that's been really important on a number of fronts, but also uh, in this case. Um, it, it critically important because it's actually the county that has um, and has had for years a longstanding contract with Journey Mental Health. And so we were able to come in and piggyback on that. Um, and not have to set up a whole separate system ourselves. Um, and so that was really important, um, having the county's participation um, there and their support, uh, you know, really did lead us to journey and um, and make that all possible. Um, I, I, and I also don't want to discount the importance of the cooperation of the dispatch center. Right. Without the dispatch center, we could not be doing this. And so that's also a county run service and has been critical and partner. Um, they have had to to change their protocols, right? And to um to really work hard um to make this possible for us. And um so that's been really important. But and then journey, you know, we we knew we needed from the very beginning, we knew we needed to have um a partner that would be able to provide us people who were mental health workers and um because of the pre-existing relationship with between journey and the county uh, that made a lot of sense for it to be them and they have been with us every step of the way from you know even way before we began helping to you know assess the situation and connect with mental health professionals and think about how like what is this all going to look like um and then obviously their folks are are out on the CARES vans every day. So they've been really instrumental. And um, another interesting thing about Journey is that a number of the folks that, that the patients that CARES is working with have a pre-existing connection to Journey. And so the fact that they have um, a history, a, you know, a patient history on folks is really valuable. Um, and really, I think, allows us to get people better care. And just so I have it straight, your teams are teams of two. Yeah. One is an EMT who's with the fire department. The other is a clinician who's with Journeys. And they yes. would have access to medical records and, yeah. and prior records. Yeah, that's right. So it's a, it's a paramedic, um, a community paramedic who works for fire. And then, yeah, a mental health worker that works for Journey. Well, that's fabulous. Um, and, okay, so let's uh, ask. Let me ask a little bit about this data analysis that surprised you, and and 
you had done a heat maps of the city. Yeah. Madison's not huge. You know, you sort of know where the problems might be, but it did surprise you. Did it surprise your other stakeholders as well? Yeah, I think so. I think it surprised the public. Um, and, uh, you know, I think part of the, um, you know, when we when we launched and we announced that we were, you know, in a defined time period, not on weekends, in a defined geography, people were like, well, that's not going to solve the problem. They're like, well, actually, we've looked at the calls <laughs> and this is what it shows. And, you know, we were able to show people the heat maps. And, um, I, yeah, I think everybody was a little surprised, except possibly the dispatch folks and, and the police officers who knew when these calls were coming in, right? Um but I, but again, I think uh, part of why people were surprised is that um, what the public sees is the sort of rare um, crisis in in public on the street, right? And and most people are not having their mental health crises out in the middle of the street. Most of that is happening at home or at work or at school, and um, so I think we just don't you know, we only know what we see, right? And it wasn't until we actually did the, looked at the data. Um, I should say that that there was a lot of data analysis before that, right? That that led to what are the actual types of calls that we are going to dispatch to. So really a lot of conversation looking at the call volumes, looking at the call types, sitting down, working with our police department, what does this mean? What kind of calls are you seeing? Would it be appropriate to send somebody else? Yes, no, maybe. How could we try? And we ended up starting in a, I think, relatively conservative position of what types of calls we were going to dispatch. Um, because we really wanted it to be successful. We didn't want anybody to get hurt. Um, and so we started small, right? And really on all fronts, we started small and uh, with the knowledge that we wanted to make that work. And then we could go bigger and bigger and bigger. And so, you know, I talked a little bit about expansion. Um, you know, we're going to go to the full week. Um, we're not yet at 24 hours a day. And uh, it may make sense to go there at some point. But what we've seen is that it, we're actually getting more from doubling down on peak hours and then potentially expanding geography. And then, you know, I think we can look at call types as well and start to edge out to to handle different call types. It's it's really uh, amazing that the data analysis is the thing that causes that shift in fear away from uh, the sort of media uh, description of crisis to recognition that this is more a mundane experience uh, that happens when, you know, during the normal course of life. So I'm glad you did. And it's great that, you as the leader of the city got a chance to be deep in that data analysis at the beginning. And now you're able to uh, really identify how this ought to expand into the future. Did In the design of the teams, did you consider at any point having people with lived experience of mental illness on the teams? Um, I, I don't think that we um, thought about that as a sort of specific criterion. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, you know, I think certainly, um, some of our teams may have that, um, uh, may have that in the future, but, um, because it was hosted in fire and we knew we were working with journey, um, mm -hmm. you know, really from the get go, um, that sort of drove who we were looking for on the response teams. And this diverge, you diverted 60%. Did I get that right? 60%. 60 no, so we're we are responding. Yeah, we're responding to sixty percent, uh, almost sixty percent of the the behavioral, uh, nonviolent behavioral health calls that come okay. in. That is an amazing number. That is, yeah. just, you in just a year. Yeah, this a little is, bit over eighteen yeah. months. Yeah, that's amazing. And what I what, as the more I talk to people about this, the benchmark stat that we need to look at over and over again. You mentioned, which is your three percent of. Person, when a call goes out, when CARES goes out to a call, only 3% of those calls does 911 get another call to send police or, or some other service. 
only 3%. 3% of the time we're bring, bringing police in. Yeah. That is a huge statistic. And that's yeah. that's really quite an achievement. Congratulations. Yeah. I don't know. Um if they, I don't know what the number is on uh, uh, if bringing in an ambulance. Um, mm. there, there may be a different number there. It just occurs to me that I don't know the answer to that. Um, but yeah, it's it is. I think, and I, I think that that we're able to achieve that three percent is um, very much related to how much we've been driven by the data and how. Um, deliberate we've been in our expansions right because i think if we sort of jumped in whole hog um you know didn't do that rigorous analysis of call type up front um you know went 24 7 right away um i don't think i think the number would be higher right i think we would not have been as successful in that and i so i, so I think that you know even though uh, you know initially i was a little impatient and certainly our city council has been I would describe them as very impatient to to grow the service. I think that that taking hmm. the deliberate approach um, has actually served us very well because it's allowed us to become familiar with the types of calls um, that CARES is best suited for and to expand slowly so that we're not starting to see um, you know challenges necessarily. And, and if we do see them, we're able to deal with them, uh, I think, much better. It's also a sign of success that you that dispatch is on board here yeah. and they're sending your teams to the right place. Yeah. Yeah. And I think one of the things that I would really and I don't want to get out ahead of the county executive here, but one of the things that I would really like to see is more resources in dispatch mm -hmm. um, so that we can um, assess and triage calls and potentially send more of them to CARES. But I think that um, that's a, that's a skill set, right? To be able to assess the call as it comes in. I actually think that some of the calls you could probably deal with in dispatch if you had somebody who was, uh, you know, trained in in mental health provision. It, you might not even need to send anybody. Um, but I, so that's a place where I think we could grow is is having more support for dispatch um, in figuring out how to deescalate a call. It, it you know in real time, but then also which calls are can be successfully dispatched to CARES. I heard yesterday from a treatment provider in St. Louis that is having clinicians sit next to the emergency communications officer yeah. and and close the call right there. Yeah. And I, I think there's a lot of potential there. Um and you know obviously it's it's not my dispatch center. So I don't get to make all those decisions, but um, but I do think that there's a lot of potential there. It's certainly one of the most important partners and often overlooked in this process of development of a team. Um, let's talk a little bit more about Madison. You have two phenomena that some of the rest of the country doesn't have. It's cold, super cold. You've got snow. Ten feet yeah, high. I mean, and, 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 less so these days, thanks to global warming, but yes. And you also have football sun Saturdays. Yeah, uh, yes. Where the do. city is completely transformed overnight. Does that change how mobile crisis operates at all? Or did you have that in your thinking? Uh so I don't think the weather uh really um has much of an impact. I mean, we as a city, right, we're used to working through all sorts of different um weather extremes and and again more and more now. Um, thanks to our changing climate, but um, you know, we, I think, I think the the nexus there is when um, you start to see the impacts of weather on mental health, right? And so you start to see, um, you know, some of the effect of winter um, and uh, you know on people's depression levels you start to see heat being triggering uh, for folks um, so but it doesn't I think affect our operations so much um, in terms of large events and certainly you know we have we have football games but um, we also have lots of large um, music festivals we have um, you know big events downtown um, where we will have you know 10 20 thousand people downtown on any given Saturday football or not um it, and that certainly um 
it, you know, it presents challenges for all sorts of different city services. Um, I think for CARES, uh, I don't think we have seen a particular um, impact in terms of increased calls. Um, I'd have to dig a little bit more into the, the data on that, but I don't think we've seen that. Um, but it also is possible that, um, you know, because that, that that's, you know, we don't have weekend service right now. So we, those calls, if they're coming in, they're going to a, a squad car um, or they're not getting answered. So, um, but I'm trying to think about like weekday events. I don't think we've seen a particular impact of that. It'd be interesting when we go to seven days a week to see if those big events um, have an impact on the the need for the service. You have another aspect to Madison, which is different than some cities. And we heard yesterday about mobile crisis in large universities. You have a city within your city. Yeah. And you mentioned that they have their own team. Um, so they have uh, a co-responder model right now. They have their own police department. They have their own dispatch on campus and they have a, they currently have a co-responder model, but they don't have a, a CARES type team. I see. And is that, that something you're, you're going to talk with them perhaps in the future? So I've talked to the chancellor recently about it. They do. Um, so their dispatch center can call CARES um, mm -hmm. if there's a need. And, um, you know, we work very closely uh, with the university, with their police department, um, and I think there's a really good partnership there. So we CARES is available to go to campus. We don't have a dedicated campus service. Um, and, you know, the, the, the fact that you don't, they're not dispatched by the same center is a little complicated. Um, but yeah, I think that, uh, you know, we would be very interested in partnering with the university to see if that, like, would they want to support an additional team um, do they, would they want to host a team on campus? I mean, this is all sort of speculative on my part, right? Um, but I think obviously there's a need, um, and uh, we, you know, we'd be happy to to help to serve that need. I mean, broadly, the way I feel about this is that we have, you know, I think we have a really good model, right? I think we have really good teams. I think they're doing really good work. Um, we've built up the infrastructure around them. I don't think that anybody, whether that's campus or our surrounding communities, should have to invest in building up that infrastructure, right? It doesn't make sense to duplicate that when mm -hmm. we could just add additional teams to serve whatever the need is. Um, so that's the conversations that I'm having with folks is, you know, are you interested in this? Would you want to chip in to support a portion of a team or a full team? so that you could get this service on what basis, what times of day, you know, what, like, what does that look like? And what I'm encouraging everybody to do is to look at their call volumes, right? And to look at mm. where their heat maps are to really inform what is the need in their community and does it make sense for them to partner with us to start to meet that need? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Get back to the data. Let me, get, let me ask uh, more about politics then. And and politics, of course, is always about money. Um, you have journeys, so you're able to bill in part to Medicaid, or they are able to bill. Yeah. But your side of the program, how are you funding that, and and what's the sustainability there? We're funding it off of the general fund, so it's very sustainable in that sense. Um, uh, except that you know we have our budget challenges, like every other community, certainly in Wisconsin, and um, we are. Uh, I think Wisconsin is unique in that the state legislature has uh, really tightened the reins on local government in terms of how much um, revenue we can raise. And so we are all, every local government in Wisconsin is in a situation where it's very difficult for us to even continue the services that we're providing now, much less grow services. But um, that aside, uh, you know, we, it's a sustainable source of funding. It's in our budget. And um, and frankly, it's not a huge expense, right? I mean, it's not it's not nothing, but it's not um, comparative to other services we provide. It's not a huge expense. And so 
um, you know, we've we've made a commitment to continue. You know, this is part of our base public safety service now. Um, and as I said, the city council has been very enthusiastic about funding cares and about expansion. So um, I I think that we will continue to see that. Um, I think we will continue to expand again in a, a relatively deliberate manner. Um, I'm hopeful that some of the partnerships that we just talked about would bring in some revenue and help us to cover some of the costs. Um, but yeah, our challenge um, in terms of funding is really the sort of broader challenge with the state. Um, I don't think there's anybody in the city that feels like we shouldn't be spending this money. That's great. And with that number is like 60% divert rate, you're saving money. You're, yeah. you're just, you're, it's so hard to hire police. They have better things to do. Tell me, um, as we're wrapping up here, uh, what's the impression of the public of the Madison Cares program? What are people saying about this? I think that the, the public has been broadly very supportive. Um, you know, people um, have a, a very positive response when we talk about CARES and we try and brief on it. Um, somewhat regularly, um, we include it in all of the public safety briefings that we do. Um, you know, we've tried to to um, get the media interested in in uh, covering the successes, and um, I think people have had a very very positive response. I, I think folks are really grateful that we've been able to to stand this up and to provide an alternative. Um, whether that's because uh, they don't feel like they want police coming to this kind of call or whether it's because they feel like they want police going to other calls, right? Like I, I sort of on both sides of the political spectrum, I think people are are happy that our police officers are able to focus more on uh, crime and the types of things that they're really trained to deal with um, as opposed to getting bogged down in mental and behavioral health crisis, which they're you know, with the exception of a few mental health officers, really broadly not trained to deal with. Well, Mayor Satya Rose, uh, Rose Conway, thank you so much for your work in Madison on Madison Cares, for your being a champion and a leader of these stakeholders. All the, you herded cats, and that's uh, quite an accomplishment. <laughs> we'll be hearing uh, from Assistant uh, or Deputy Chief Chase Dedman in a little bit, and he'll get into the nuts and bolts, the details of his dashboard, which is very impressive in itself. Yeah. Well, it's thank my you. pleasure to be here. And thank you for the great conversation. And thanks to everybody listening. And um, again, we are available um, if folks want to learn more about the Madison Cares program and come visit Madison. <laughs>